So um, today we're going to um, sort of pick up where we were on the most recent uh, classes. So in the last few class sessions, we were looking at some changes in high energy particle theory uh, in uh, with the development of things like quantum chromodynamics and so on, and ways to try to make sense of very high energy interactions among uh, elementary particles, or, or at least particles in smaller than an atom. Uh, and then in our most recent class session, we looked at some of the um, kind of shifts within the fields of study, um, including the emergence of this, of this relatively new subfield called particle cosmology, which really kind of came together in the mid, starting in the mid 1970s, partly because of some really exciting new ideas, but also as we've uh, looked at in some detail, because of uh, some broader kind of institutional, even, even geopolitical shifts uh, in the physics profession uh, that really helped some of these new ideas um, kind of take hold in a way that they might not have uh, in other times or places. So today we're gonna focus on uh, a kind of example of, of that new subfield, a relatively new subfield, uh, that's um, known as, as inflationary cosmology or simply cosmic inflation. So to make sense of that, we're gonna first look at some of the work uh, to in, in uh, cosmology before this kind of merger of fields, before uh, particle cosmology really kind of came in uh, into its own. And then we'll look at, um, so we'll look at the, 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 the uh, coalescence of what came to be called the Big Bang model, still uh, enormously successful framework for trying to make sense of very large scale changes in our universe over a long sweep of time. And then we'll see that already by the 1970s uh, and 80s, there were some kind of curiosities or, or, or maybe inconsistencies with that uh, otherwise quite successful model. And so people began thinking about shortcomings of the Big Bang model around the time that this new subfield of particle cosmology began kind of uh, to come together. And then we'll see how cosmic inflation emerged from that particular um, moment to try to address um, some of the shortcomings while retaining some of the successes. So it's a framework for trying to understand the, the kind of uh, evolution of our universe over uh, a huge expanse of time, increasingly using tools at the interface, not just of Einstein's general theory of relativity, but also uh, ideas about particle physics and high energy phenomena. So that's where we're heading today, and, and the asterisk sort to remind you, there's a, a set of strictly optional lecture notes uh, on the Canvas site, which go into a little bit more detail uh, of some of these uh, parts from the lecture, uh, again, strictly for your own interest as your interest in time allows. But if some of these things go by kind of quickly, there's some more material there, and again, I'd be glad to chat more about this uh, if questions come up beyond that. Okay, so oftentimes uh, astronomers uh, will describe the feature the, the sort of most salient features of our universe in terms of what they call large scale structure. It's really quite remarkable. And this has been uh, emerged, this picture has been emerging really over a century for, for a hundred years or even more. That when astronomers turn their telescopes to the sky and look at many different length scales, many different characteristic lengths, either um, very, very, very large length scales this is a modern example from the Hubble Deep Field, the Hubble Telescope Deep Field Survey, where you can look at <clears throat> clusters and even super clusters of galaxies on enormous scales, tens or even um, thousands of, uh, uh, let's see, I wanna get my units right. Basically billions of light years across, it's a huge scale. Or we can zoom into the size of, of single galaxies like the Andromeda Galaxy or our own Milky Way Galaxy or if we zoom in even closer to home with the solar system, or even really in human terms, there are concentrations of enormous matter and energy and activity separated by huge voids. I like to make the joke with my apologies to Tiffany that in the Cambridge example, we have all the stuff happening like by the Stata Center, whereas there's nothing at all happening at Harvard. Is that right, Tiffany? Just a simple nod, yes or no? Yeah, okay. Sorry, Tiffany, I'm teasing. The point is on scales from like, you know, kilometers out to billions of light years and everything in between, we find this kind of lumpiness that there's a pattern to it. Matter is not uniformly smushed out in space, thank goodness, right? There is actually sort of teeming pockets of activity separated by large uh, voids uh, uh, where, where very little matter or, or energy is, uh, is located. And so one of the questions is what could account for that structure across these scales from meters or kilometers up to tens of billions of light years? 
it turns out that ordinary gravity, even Newtonian gravity, let alone Einstein's fancier version that we looked at uh, in class, general theory of relativity, that these fr gravitational frameworks are sufficient to help us make sense of this kind of uh, uh, hierarchy of scales, of structure across large distance uh, scales. <clears throat> If we assume to start, there's some initial very tiny lumpiness to begin with. If we assume some very tiny inhomogeneity, a little bit of unevenness in the distribution of matter and energy at early times, then gravity will do the rest. Gravity will make those regions that happen to have slightly more matter or energy per unit volume than average. The gravitational uh, force will then attract more and more matter and energy to those local regions. So it'll become more and more dense, more um, uh, sort of pockets of activity. And meanwhile, the, the areas that happen to start out with slightly less than average matter and energy per volume, slightly under dense regions, will become more and more further evacuated. And so you can, you can account for, even in, in much more quantitative uh, precision, much more detail, we can account for this array of structure from human size scales out to the supergalactic using really only gravity, as long as we start with, with some initial, otherwise unaccounted for lumpiness. A tiny amount of unevenness in the distribution of matter and energy will grow more and more uneven over time. So a challenge for astronomers for a century or so has been to try to sort of make that account more precise and more quantitative and compare it with more and more kinds of observations. And there have been two main conceptual ingredients, especially uh, as we'll come to in the more recent versions of this in the era of particle cosmology. One of the sets of tools, the conceptual ingredients, not surprisingly, is some theory of gravity. And, and uh, since <clears throat> the early years of the 20th century, as we've seen many times in this class, the framework of choice has been Einstein's general theory of relativity, which as we've seen, describes uh, the phenomena that we associate with gravitation as really being nothing but geometry, being local deformations, local curvature in this almost physical type fabric of space-time uh, in response to the distribution of matter and energy. And the other main ingredient, especially, as I say, refined in, in recent years uh, with insights from high energy nuclear and particle physics, has been some prevailing understanding of matter, especially matter at very high energies and temperatures. Matter that consists of things like electrons and photons, matter that nowadays people are pretty well convinced consists of things like quarks and gluons, and even some more exotic particles like the Higgs particle that we looked at at least a little briefly uh, in uh, the previous class. So we have these two ingredients of the kind of the structure and behavior of space-time as governed presumably by Einstein's theory or something perhaps similar to it. And then the stuff that's filling that space-time, an idea about matter, especially how matter behaves at very high energies and densities. So with those two ingredients, the goal has been, again, for, for many decades, to account for the observational features of our universe, even on very large scales. So as a reminder, the, uh, the so-called field equations of Einstein's general theory of relativity take this deceptively simple looking form. This side is what he had to learn from his friend, Marcel Grossman. This is the geometry of a warping space-time, the way to quantify things like gradients, rates of change of uh, space and time. And this tells you where the stuff is. This is the distribution of matter and energy. Pretty soon after Einstein uh, sort of arrived at this form of, of his field equations in November of 1915, within a few years, Einstein himself and then soon uh, several other colleagues began applying these equations not only to local phenomena, like say the warping of space outside the sun, uh, let his uh, friend, uh, uh, Schwarzschild first, uh, Carl Schwarzschild first found an exact solution for uh, very early in, in, in this work, not only for local phenomena, but actually for global phenomena. Could one build a, at least a toy model of an entire universe that might satisfy or might be governed by Einstein's field equations? And actually some other colleagues were very quick to find that there were some exact solutions even on this global or universal cosmic scale that would satisfy Einstein's equation. They took three particularly simple forms. Depending on the amount of stuff, depending on the, on the distribution of matter and energy, if you assume that the matter and energy was spread out perfectly uniformly as a toy model, uh, a, uh, a, a uniform density of stuff per volume, then depending on whether there was more, more than some critical value, less than some critical value, 
or exactly equal to some critical value. You have these kind of Goldilocks situations for the global shape of space in response to how much stuff per volume was filling that toy universe. If you had more than some critical value, a critical value that came from the equations themselves, above that, an over dense region, space itself would warp back onto itself like a closed sphere, the surface of a closed sphere, that would be a positively curved geometry globally. If you had less stuff per volume, if the universe were under dense compared to that critical value, then in fact, the universe would kind of open up away from itself. You'd have a hyperbolic solution or an open geometry with negative curvature. And only if the amount of stuff per volume were exactly equal to that critical value, would the sections uh, of space be flat, obey the geometry uh, of ordinary Euclidean geometry. And so um, you could have these global features, for example, on, on a positively curved uh, geometrical surface, uh, parallel lines, lines that are parallel at the equator, like these here, will actually converge at the pole. So lines that are parallel in some part of the space will not remain parallel forever. That breaks the Euclidean assumption, the fifth postulate about parallel lines. Likewise, on a positively curved surface, you can draw a triangle and add up the sum of the angles in, in contained within that triangle and add up to more than, 90, more than 180 degrees, whereas Euclidean triangles have to have exactly 180 degrees. Likewise, for open ge uh, geometry, parallel lines will actually diverge. They'll get further and further apart from each other uh, over distance instead of remaining parallel, and triangles will, will sum up to have less than 180 degrees uh, of the internal angle. So there are these self-consistent non-Euclidean geometries and they could apply not only to local physics like the warping of space-time outside uh, a massive object like the sun, but even to these toy universes, these otherwise very simple universes, simple models of a universe as a whole. Well, very soon after that, people, not Einstein himself, he thought this was horrible, but some of his colleagues who began pursuing these uh, cosmological solutions began to realize that they, the, sh the universe could not only have a shape at a given moment in time, but it could the shape could change over time or the size could change over time. You could have expanding or collapsing solutions also strictly consistent with Einstein's equations. Einstein thought that was horrible. He had a very strong kind of aesthetic and philosophical preference for a universe that had no beginning, that was simply static, that would look the same for any observer at any moment for an, an infinite expanse of time. But other colleagues showed at least it was consistent with his own equations to have universes that would change over time. They could either expand or cont contract. That was actually a prediction made by some of these colleagues even before some empirical evidence began to come in, starting in the late 1920s with some, at the time, absolutely enormous telescopes. Now they're kind of pipsqueaks compared to what astronomers have today. But at what was at the, at the time, some of the largest telescopes available on the planet, astronomers like Edwin Hubble in Southern California were able to collect information and uh, about not just the distribution of distant galaxies, but could also measure how rapidly they were moving with respect to us by measuring a Doppler shift, slight shifts in the spectral lines uh, of those uh, associated with those galaxies. And Hubble found this remarkable trend that the further away from us a given galaxy was, the faster it tended to be moving away from us further still. So the objects that were relatively close to us were moving away from us at one average speed. Objects that were further away were moving further away from us now were moving even further away from us at a faster speed. So there's a linear relationship, remarkably close to linear relationship between the objects distance from us today and the rate at which they're moving further away from us. That became known as Hubble's law, more recently amended to be the hubble lemaitre law, because it was actually predicted first by a theoretical physicist even before Hubble had found that data. Now we have, of course, as you know, the Hubble Space Telescope named in honor of Edwin Hubble, which has been able to extend this to extraordinarily far distances, not just the ones that Hubble could access with his uh, ground-based telescope. And the basic trend holds. There's some interesting deviations, but the idea is nonetheless uh, evidence consistent with our universe expanding, not just having a shape to it, but actually stretching and getting larger over time. So you can actually then work backwards and say, for how long has our universe, our observable universe been stretching? When did this kind of stretching or expanding phase begin? You can kind of work it backwards and say, given the rate of expansion that can be measured today, whether with Hubble's techniques or now with the more modern ones with space-based telescopes, 
work it back and it's consistent with the beginning of that expansion being not quite 14 billion years ago, billions of years ago, that our own universe seems to have been stretching and getting larger and larger. So this gentleman here, whose name I already mentioned briefly, uh, Georges Lemaitre, was really at the forefront of this work, starting in the 1920s and, 20s and throughout the 1930s. You might notice in this photograph, he's wearing a, a Catholic priest's clerical collar. Georges Lemaitre is, a, I think, a fascinating scholar. He was indeed an ordained Catholic priest. He was also an MIT-trained PhD astrophysicist. He studied briefly, in, he was originally Belgian, he studied briefly in Cambridge, England with one of the first converts to general relativity, Arthur Eddington. Then he came to MIT to finish his PhD and then was, was finding many of these solutions to Einstein's field equations even before Einstein did. And in fact, Einstein kept thinking he must be wrong and then Lemaitre kept being right. So they became uh, very nice colleagues, but uh, Einstein started off by, by always being frustrated that Lemaitre found solutions that Einstein found kind of abhorrent or disgusting. And yet Lemaitre showed they were at least mathematically self-consistent and gradually became more and more relevant in the light of data like Edwin Hubble's about the expanding universe. Lemaitre was one of the first to start thinking about playing that film strip backwards. To say, if things are, are moving further apart from each other on average today, and if the universe in general is expanding today, then was it in fact smaller at earlier times? You can imagine kind of playing a film strip backwards and watching these galaxies actually uh, approach each other as you look at earlier and earlier times, heading back toward that roughly 14 billion year old um, starting point. So it was really Lemaitre who began writing about this both in technical papers and soon in some very charming, uh, more popular books that if the universe is getting bigger today, it must have been smaller in the past. And what if you ride that all the way back? Was there a kind of primeval moment? Was there a single moment when all the matter of the universe, at least all the matter that we can see, was actually on top of each other? That the universe should have started in a very, very hot and dense state and been expanding ever since, maybe infinitely dense. But either way, there was a moment when all the stuff that we see in the sky should have been closer and closer and closer together and been stretching and expanding ever since. So it's Lemaitre who begins thinking about what comes to be known, the Big Bang model. He was calling it the primeval atom, that there was this initial kind of fireball from a very, very hot, dense state, and he was very eager to understand the early stages of that expansion. <clears throat> That's where things stood really through the 1930s. As we saw, there were a number of kind of disruptions uh, when um, much of the world uh, descended into, into the Second World War. And then soon after the Second World War, new groups began coming back to these somewhat old questions. Some of the newer groups had experience with things like the Manhattan Project, and in general were much better versed in things like nuclear physics than had been known even in Lemaitre's day. So they both, uh, the, the field had expanded and some of these folks had direct experience from things like the Manhattan Project, one of them, one of whom was actually uh, George Gamow. So one of the most active groups soon after the Second World War was based uh, at the advanced, um, excuse me, the Applied Physics Laboratory. We looked briefly at this uh, when we talked about the Second World War. That was another one of these um, US-based uh, defense laboratories built in a hurry to try to advance a bunch of wartime defense projects. It was much like the MIT RAD lab. At, at the Applied Physics Lab, they worked on things like proximity fuses and so on. Starting very soon after the war, there was some unclassified research uh, going on at, the, at that research lab as well. Uh, and George Gamow was advising two younger physicists, uh, Robert Herman and Ralph Alpher. Here's a famous composite photograph. Um, they're making more than a, a, a not so subtle gesture the fact that Gamow was widely rumored at least to, have, to enjoy his drink. So his head is emerging from the vapors of uh, Cointreau, of, of a liqueur. So this was a trio that began coming back to some of these questions about the very early universe, inspired by the writings of Georges Lemaitre, but now with a lot more uh, knowledge about high energy interactions among elementary particles as well. And a series of really quite kind of ahead of its time, far-sighted sort of work starting in the late 1940s, this trio and a, and a small number of other colleagues around the world began trying to fill in this picture, this primeval fireball picture. And in fact, uh, it soon became known simply as the Big Bang model. They realized that if the universe was very hot and dense at early times, then the conditions in which these elementary particles would find themselves should be quite different than what we find around, uh, commonly around ourselves today. In particular, at early times, 
the ambient energy, the interaction that any random elementary particle would likely carry should be very, very high. The temperature, after all, is just a measure of kinetic energy of motion. So if a very high temperature, that's like saying that the average kinetic energy of each constituent, each elementary particle, was very high. It could have been, for example, higher than the binding energy of stable hydrogen atoms. So every, if that were the case, then every time some positively charged nuclear particle, like even just a single proton, would approach or be in proximity to a negatively charged electron, they might begin to form a stable electrically neutral hydrogen atom, which of course is just a bound state of one electron and one proton. But before they could form that single stable atom, some ambient uh, particles from the environment, like a single photon, would have such high energies would come and zap them apart because the average energy of everything was higher than that binding energy of um, the Coulomb attraction of hydrogen. So at early times, you would have an electrically charged plasma that the universe would not be filled with electrically neutral atoms because they literally couldn't form yet because they were blasted apart every time a single putative atom got close enough to begin to form the average kind of jostling of, of all this high temperature uh, junk in its environment would blast it apart. So <clears throat> photons then become trapped between charged particles. At early times, they begin to reason uh, to piece all this together. At early times in cosmic history, the universe should have been opaque. You literally couldn't, wouldn't have been able to see anything because the mean free path of any given photon would be very, very short. The photons would each be trapped, like kicked like these, um, like soccer balls between all these loose electric charges that the, the um, you know, light can't propagate in, an, in, a, in a charged plasma because it's always bouncing between uh, these very nearby free electric charges. So you could calculate and say, when would that effect um, go away? Well, when the average or ambient temperature fell below the kind of average binding, binding energy of a single hydrogen atom. And that would happen at a distinct moment in cosmic history. So again, they were trying to flesh out Lemaitre's picture of an evolving universe. It wasn't just hot and dense at one time, that that would mean that certain kinds of interactions among ele elementary particles would, uh, would dominate and then the, those would change over time. In particular, as this entire hot ball of gas of, char of charged plasma is expanding, the average temperature should decrease inside, much like the, the, the temperature of a gas inside a balloon will fall as the balloon expands. So as the volume of space stretches, as you have an expanding universe, as Lemaitre showed uh, what could be possible, the average temperature of all the stuff inside it should fall. It should fall in a quantitatively calculable way, again, using Einstein's equations. So again, they put numbers to that and said, so, well, at a, at, a, at a particular moment in time, now using the, the modern values, they had the right idea, the different values for some measurements. We now calculate that around 380,000 years, after the start of that stretching, after that primeval atom begins to expand, the ambient or average temperature of all the junk inside that universe should have fallen below this uh, kind of Coulomb attractive uh, energy for neutral hydrogen. So whereas at earlier times, earlier than 380,000 years, uh, you would have a, a charged plasma and an opaque universe, at that moment, the average energy per, per photon or per elementary particle would fall so that you could actually begin to form stable uh, atoms of hydrogen. So only at that time, a new phase in, our, in, in the universe would begin to unfold. The universe would be filled with neutral atoms of hydrogen. And now you have a, a mean free path for light that's arbitrarily long. Light can pass through electrically neutral matter. It does so in our own atmosphere, let alone in empty space. So once you can have stable electrically neutral atoms like hydrogen atoms at a particular moment in the kind of cooling evolution history of our universe, only then would you have uh, things like photons traveling macroscopic distances. So at that, after that time, when the temperature has fallen below about 10,000 degrees Kelvin, photons are free and then they begin, they, they can now travel large distances and their, uh, their energy continues to, um, to redshift. They lose energy as the universe continues to expand. So the energy of those photons would have started at the equivalent of around 10,000 degrees Kelvin. 
And now today would be much, much, much lower than that because the universe has been expanding and draining that average energy per particle over time. <clears throat> so that today the universe should be filled with this remnant glow. This is all work that they predict uh, around 1948, 49, 50, Gamow, Herman, and Alfred. So they, are, they argue that today this, this bath of remnant radiation from that early hot dense state should be filling the sky in every direction. It should be more or less an even distribution, a kind of uniform glow. But instead of it being a very, very high energy kind of X-ray or gamma ray radiation, it should be redshifted all the way down in the, into the low energy microwave band. So this, they, this became known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. And they say this should be filling the sky. It should be everywhere in a uniform pattern. Here's an aside. I like to think about this. Uh, that's very abstract. I think about it as a kind of uh, a, the evolution of a dance party. It turns out I don't attend dance parties um, very often. This is what the internet tells me they look like. So this I'm sure is accurate. If you just Google dance party and throw away the bad pictures, look, anyway. So at early times, the DJ is playing some raucous you know, house music and everyone's just jostling around. The average energy per dancer is very high. So I'm told. That's like the sort of charged particles uh, where the mean free path is effectively zero. No one could cross that, that dance floor. And then at a calculable moment, if the DJ knows what she's doing, she'll put on some slow music and you start having couples form like in Harry Potter at the Yule Ball. Again, that's what I assume school dancers are like, I don't really know. So at some later calculable moment, the average energy in the room begins to fall. The DJ reads the room and now you start having couples so that there, you actually could cross the floor because now you have a mean free path to cross the dance floor, unlike that uh, very exciting early universe phase when everything's just a mash or a mush. This makes perfect sense to me. You can tell me whether it's accurate or not. Anyway, that's the, that's the analogy for what uh, Gamow, uh, Alpha and Herman were, were putting real numbers to, to try to make sense of these different phases of the very early universe. Very high, uh, high temperature early, um, dense state should be qualitatively different in its behavior than a later lower energy state. So they predicted as early as 1948 that there should be this remnant glow from the Big Bang, all those photons that only then at 380,000 years after the Big Bang were able to start streaming freely. And the question was, where is it? Well, uh, almost 20 years later, 15 years later, these two uh, radio physicists working at Bell Labs, Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias, we're using a new horn antenna, so uh, sensitive to radio, microwave and radio band frequencies. This is basically like leftover from the early telecommunications age. Soon after the launch of Sputnik, lots of folks like private companies wanted to get into the satellite communications business. Often it's just bouncing radio waves off of reflectors in the sky in low earth orbit and then bouncing signal back to earth. Of course, it became more and more sophisticated than that. And they were actually given time on this telescope, not only to fine tune the kind of corporate program for, for telephonics, but also to conduct actual radio astronomy. They were, they were interested in the evolution of nearby galaxies. They were not doing cosmology. They were interested in, in um, radio signatures of, near, of, of astronomically nearby things. But they found this remnant hum in their electronics. This should have been the, among the most precise instruments available on the planet for that uh, band of the spectrum. And they couldn't get rid of a residual hum. At one point, they climbed inside that huge horn antenna on their hands and knees to scrub out what they graciously called um, special uh, dielectric materials from pigeons who had made a nest in there. That, of course, meant pigeon droppings because they figured that might be uh, messing with the electronics. There's some uh, extra insulating layer that didn't make any difference. And finally, they were put in touch with a group at Princeton that was uh, independently rediscovering many of the ideas from George Gamow and his group, uh, actually at the time unaware that Gamow had even done these calculations. And they likewise convinced themselves about this cosmic microwave background remnant radiation. So now the group here, th these folks were in uh, Southern Jersey, they were close to Princeton, they all got together. They said, oh, what you found is actually the remnant glow from the bag. This residual hum in your receiver, consistent with an energy of about three degree above zero, three degrees Kelvin, was really the, the leftover photons, that remnant hot radiation from the Big Bang that had been streaming freely for the next 14 billion years. And the average energy per photon had fallen steadily since the time when they were first released in that early dance party. They were very soon afterwards awarded the Nobel Prize for actually detecting evidence of the Big Bang. So let me pause there and ask any questions. Any questions on that stuff so far? 
so far. So yeah, actually, this might be a this might be a dumb question. Um, Go for it. But. I guess I'm just I'm just wondering how if you have photons that are like like I, I understand that you know um, the photons from the CMB like they're from us looking in the past, but I don't understand like why they're still there like why they haven't like passed this already. Um, I guess like you know are they like constantly being emitted or? Why so, can't we? Why is it still there, basically? Yeah, but thank you, Steve. That's, that's actually really, that's a really good question. Basically, the idea is that they should be they should have been everywhere at once. So the idea was the whole universe is filled in the early times with very high energy particles that are at, at early early times too high energy to form stable electrically neutral atoms. So you have this huge plasma everywhere, not just in one one corner, not just like over there in the sky, but everywhere. Uh, and likewise, there are photons sort of everywhere, it was at least the idea, uh, more or less uniformly distributed with no real pattern to it. And so from every part, part of space, from every single direction in the sky, those photons began to move freely at this single moment in time, or a very short-lived moment in time. So basically, the universe should have been filled with light, uh, originally very high energy, and then actually uh, the energy of that light should be falling uh, as, as as the container expands, so as the average energy inside that sort of balloon uh, goes down. So that we're basically just moving through a bath of light. So the, the photons aren't coming from like that direction of the sky, the way we think of with point-like sources, there's a galaxy there, a quasar, you know, a particular bright star in our neighborhood. The photons were everywhere and we're, it's like sitting in a bathtub full of these photons. And they're just losing their energy as, as the, um, as the overall size of space uh, continues to grow. So the idea was that there should be, a, so it's not just that they should have a, a particular temperature, they should be everywhere in the sky was the idea, a uniform pattern. So if they could point that radio telescope in any direction uh, and they should find more or less the same signal, which is indeed what, what, they, uh, what they were finding. So imagine, so think about sitting in a bathtub that at first is like boiling hot water and then you're sitting there while the, while the water continues to cool down, but you're still kind of immersed in that. The light, the light, the photons are coming from every single region of space. And all that's changing is their, is their average temperature per photon is, is the main idea. Another way of saying that is it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, hard, to get, it's hard to get one's head around, believe me. But instead of saying like the Big Bang happened over there and things are stretching out from it, the Big Bang happens sort of everywhere. So every place, every part of space that we could see today um, once had been at the Big Bang. So to speak. the Big Bang happened there. It happened at X equals zero and X equals one. The, any place we could put spatial coordinates to on this model, those all experienced the Big Bang at the same time. So it wasn't the bang happened there and stuff is flowing outward from it towards us. Again, think about being sort of inside a balloon or let's say a bathtub. So there, so the there should be a uniform set of properties filling that space, and we're just immersed in it, trying to kind of measure it as we as we flow through. I'd be glad to chat more about that, but that's that's um, um, I say all that as if that's obvious. It's not obvious. I'd be glad to chat more about it, but that's the kind of reckoning that that uh, people like Lemaitre got very comfortable with, starting in the 20s and 30s, and it took other people a lot longer to try to kind of get their heads around. Alex rightly puts in in the chat that uh, Edwin Hubble was actually. Uh, pretty lucky. Uh, it's true, there, there's been a, a tremendous amount of controversy right to this day, or let's just say uh, earnest um, disagreement, over what's called the cosmic distance ladder, which is to say it's actually pretty easy now, relatively easy, to measure the speeds with which objects are moving away from us, because that has to do with spectroscopy. We, we can measure these atomic transition lines with great, great accuracy, and so you can just do a Doppler shift and say, oh, I would expect that line to be here, it's over here, and the difference is a direct measure of the, of the relative speed, the kind of recession speed. What's not so easy is to figure out how far away from us that thing is right now, the actual distance right now. We, we can get the velocity from, from these very fancy spectroscopic. I say we, the people who do it are actually astronomers. They, they, they kindly share their information. I don't know how to do it. But you know, one can do it well. Now, whole teams can do it very, very well. What's hard to do is to calibrate what's called the distance ladder. How far away is that object? right now, let alone how quickly is it continuing to move away. And so this was especially off compared to modern day values in Hubble's time. In fact, his value was, um, well, let's see, 500 to versus 70. So to, uh, what we now call Hubble's parameter is roughly 70 inappropriate units. And he measured 500. 
So he measured a much quicker average rate of expansion than, than what we have kind of mostly settled on today. Um, but the basic picture was, was there. The picture was enough to get people to start paying attention, a small number of people, to pay attention, pay attention to um, Georges Lemaitre's otherwise quite obscure mathematical solutions. So Lemaitre, there's also a, a Russian and by then Soviet physicist, uh, Alexander Friedman, who was doing very similar work. A few of these mathematical physicists were using Einstein's equations in ways that Einstein thought was awful. As I say, he was not at all a fan of this early on. But it, it looked to many people who, to the few people who paid any attention at all, it looked like just a kind of mathematical curiosity. Uh, and it was only when paired with uh, observations, most famously from Hubble, Hubble actually had a number of assistants and other groups began uh, contributing as well. But it was, it was Hubble's data that got the biggest splash, that made the biggest impact on the community at the time. And regardless of whether we agree with the number he inferred of the actual rate, it seemed pretty clear to many people at the time that this was, a, was a consistent with an actual overall expansion, with a change over time. And that made these seemingly pure mathematical solutions like Friedman's and especially the follow-up work by Georges Lemaitre, that made those mathematical solutions look much, much more um, curious and interesting than they had prior to Hubble's data. Although Alex, you're absolutely right that his, his value was, if one took his value literally, it looked like the universe would be younger than things inside it. And that leads, that's not good, right? So how could the Milky Way galaxy or even the planet Earth be older than the universe in which it resides? So it did lead to these kinds of puzzles. And that was eventually kind of smoothed over or, or made more consistent by the 1950s. That took a while. It's an excellent point. Any other questions on that? Okay. So this is a remarkably, I think, safe to say, remarkably successful set of ideas that eventually becomes called the Big Bang model, going all the way back to really to Einstein, but especially people like George Lemaitre, a huge boost to try to give real quantitative kind of teeth to his internal phases or intermediate phases by people like George Gamow and his uh, younger assistants. And it starts to match observations really uh, quite well. And yet, it, we're not done. And people began to get worried about some of these uh, features of the Big Bang model, not only to cherish its successes. So for this next part, it's actually really helpful to adopt convenient coordinates. If we accept the notion that there's a kind of universal stretching of space, then it's actually helpful to kind of, um, to, to adopt coordinates that kind of take that into account. So, uh, so what, we, what we tend to, astronomers have done really for, for generations, is to adopt what are called co-moving coordinates. And then a physical coordinate at any given moment in time would be scaled by this universal stretching, this so-called scale factor. So that Hubble's data was consistent with galaxies sitting still at some fixed co-moving location. They could, you could plot down the Andromeda galaxy at r equals seven. And then it's moving away from us because all of space is stretching in between. So you could have galaxies that are more or less sitting still locally, but are receding from us, just as we are receding from them, because the space in between is stretching and you can accommodate that by inserting this one kind of universal stretching function it's called the scale factor. So the distance between say the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy at any given time, the physical distance really would change. It is getting more distant over time because the space in between is stretching. So if you plot things in terms of what's called co-moving distance, you kind of scale out, you take into account that universal scaling, then it would just look like Milky Way's at r equals zero and Andromeda's stuck at r equals seven in, in, these, in these convenient coordinates. Then you have to be a little more clever to adopt your clock to make things again, actually really simple. This is actually called conformal time that remi might remind you of our beloved friends, the 19th century Cambridge Wranglers, at least my beloved friends. We, we looked briefly at the Wrangler stuff at these conformal mappings. We're really doing a Wranglerish thing here. Very similar idea to adopt coordinates for the time, for the rate at which we think clocks should tick to be convenient, that also takes into account that changing stretching rates over time. And so what we call conformal time, often labeled by the Greek letter tau, is basically a variable tick rate that is really convenient because then we can start making a, a dynamical changing space time look just like the space time of special relativity, look just like a Minkowski diagram. Why do we do all this funny stuff that I had to wave my hands around for co-moving distance and conformal time? Because when we make plot, space time plots, 
where we use co-moving distance rather than physical distance for the spatial part and conformal time, this variable clock rate rather than what's called cosmic time or sometimes simply called physical time. Then actually we get back to some simple looking arrangements like light rays once again travel on 45 degree diagonals. If we were to try to take into account the changing stretching rate of space, these paths of light rays become these very complicated uh, bent twisted kind of paths. But in these special, very simplifying coordinates, light just travels on 45 degree diagonals. We sit still at a fixed value of co-moving uh, location, and then light comes to us along 45 degrees. That sounds very abstract. We do that all the time. This is just an example in space time of a conformal mapping of the sort that we all use every day, like a Mercator projection. So what this does is, is it inserts certain kinds of, um, of, of location dependent um, um, artifacts like Antarctica looks huge on a Mercator projection or Greenland for that matter. The surface area of Antarctica is nowhere near the surface area of Africa, even though it looks so much larger. But that's because we've had a stretching and the amount of stretching increases toward the poles. If we do uh, a two dimensional spatial conformal map, we're doing the same thing here. We're stretching our time coordinate. So time gets more and more stretched out uh, towards earlier times. We, we can take that into account. We know how to use a Mercator projection and it makes other relationships remarkably easy. Likewise, our conformal maps here make the paths of light, for example, very easy to follow. So this starts, when people begin using these, uh, these convenient coordinates, they also go back to some questions about or, or features of the Big Bang model and they start, start having new questions. So we, we talked briefly last time about Robert Dickey. He was, again, a, a veteran of some of the wartime projects. He was a, an expert in microwave electronics, a kind of radar, rad lab veteran. And after the war, he went back to Princeton. Uh, and about 10 years after that, became very interested in general relativity and cosmology. He began retooling his whole research group around questions related to things like the Big Bang. We saw that in 1961, uh, he published this alternate to Einstein's own theory of gravity, the Brands Dickey theory of gravity, which we looked at last time. It's the same Robert Dickey. So he introduced this conundrum uh, in 1969. So uh, soon after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, when people began to take the Big Bang model more and more seriously, including Robert Dickey. He goes back to what I mentioned briefly before, that according to Einstein's equations, as sort of clarified by people like uh, Alexander Friedman and Georges Lemaitre, you can have these very simple geometries at any given moment in time, the shape of space could either have a positive geometry where it closes back on itself, like the surface of a sphere, an open or negatively uh, curved geometry, or a flat geometry. And what controls which geometry you have is this ratio of the actual amount of stuff per volume, the actual density of matter and energy per volume, compared to some critical value. So uh, it became common after Dickey to just introduce the, the Greek letter capital omega simply to, to, to refer to that ratio. What's the, what's the ratio of the actual stuff per volume in our universe compared to that critical value? And only for that kind of Goldilocks solution where you have exactly the balanced amount of stuff per volume, would you expect to have space obey uh, Euclidean geometry on large scales? If omega is larger than one, you have more stuff per volume, you have a positive curvature. If omega is smaller than one, you have less stuff per volume than a critical value, you expect this open or hyperbolic geometry. So far, so good. Then Dickey plugged this quantity into Einstein's own equations. So this is a time dependent quantity. After all, we're talking about densities. The density should depend on the volume, it's stuff per volume. If you have a universe expanding over time, the volume should be changing over time. So the density should presumably go down, right? The density should fall. If you have a fixed amount of stuff in a space time and you, you stretch that space, the density falls. If you throw four marbles into a, into a bucket, you have a density of four per, per, per you know, cubic uh, liter, let's say, if it's a, a cubic liter bucket. If you double size the bucket, then you have only four marbles, but now a larger volume, the density has gone down. And so what, what Dickey demonstrated is that according to Einstein's equations, this solution that, that looks like the Goldilocks solution, the spatially flat solution, we have just the right amount of stuff per volume, is actually an unstable solution, it's an unstable equilibrium point of Einstein's equations. A universe should, be, should generically become more and more different from flat over time. And if you just plug in the notion that the density is falling like one over the volume, the volume should go like 
the cube of the of the um, kind of spatial dimensions sort of go like a cubed. So in fact, this quantity from this part comes just from Einstein's equations, one over a squared, a being that scale factor, kind of like the radius at any given moment in time. And rho is the density of stuff per volume. Well, if the rho is going like one over a cubed, then this whole quantity here should grow with a scale factor. So the difference from a flat universe, the deviation from spatial flatness, Dickey shows, generically should grow over time. If a universe started out being close to, but not identically equal to flat at early times, it should look nothing like spatially flat at later times. It could, it, it, depending on the, on the sign, it could either become more and more like a hyperbolic saddle or more and more like a closed sphere. What it should not do is say looking anything like the flat the Euclidean solution. So if you extrapolate this backwards to early times, like the time of nucleosynthesis, for example, uh, or even to the times of, um, of when the, the cosmic microwave background radiation was released, you find that you have to fine tune, you have to have some reason why the amount of stuff per volume was not just in the neighborhood of that critical value, but in fact was exponentially close to it. You start, as Dickey points out, you have these exponential fine tunings. For the universe to be even remotely close to a spatially flat or Euclidean-like behavior today, which was looking more and more consistent with observations uh, by the 60s and 70s and 80s, even if it, if it wasn't compellingly equal to flat, it was uh, this parameter omega was say 0.3. It wasn't 10 to the minus 70. It wasn't five. It was uh, 0.3 or 1.1. It was in the rough vicinity of one to the extent that the measurements could, could converge the observations. And yet a measurement of anywhere near one today suggested that it had to have been exponentially close to one at early times. And that seems like this very strange or unexplained fine tuning. If the universe has been stretching for 14 billion years, what set it to be so exponentially arbitrarily close to spatially flat, given that that is an unstable equilibrium point? So that became known as, what, what, as a flatness problem. That was introduced by Bob Dickey in 1969. Dickey actually was really thorough. He was thinking about other things too. So 10 years later, he introduced the next big real conundrum for the Big Bang model. And this one he did with his uh, younger student, by that point, his collaborator, uh, James Peebles. You might know Peebles' name. He actually just uh, received the Nobel Prize in physics uh, a little over a year ago for much, for much of this work. Peebles had done his PhD with Dickey at Princeton. So 10 years later, Dickey and Peebles introduced what, what, the second big conundrum, and this one's called the horizon problem. So now let's go back these very convenient conformal diagrams. So I'm going to use the same funny coordinates I mentioned before. I'm, map, I'm mapping the history of the universe using co-moving distances. So I've taken into account that universal stretching of space and that variable clock rate, that, um, that conformal time. So now, according to this very lovely picture that people like George Gamow and uh, Ralph uh, Alpha and Robert Herman put together, we should be receiving these microwave photons today from literally every direction in the sky. This goes back to Stephen's question. Imagine you have a three-dimensional version of this. Everywhere in the sky, you see these photons heading toward us. Some of them are heading away from us, but we're just immersed in a bath. The ones that we see have been heading on trajectories toward us since they were first released, since that moment, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when photons could begin streaming freely, when they could travel macroscopic distances because the universe is filled with electrically neutral matter. There's some moment after which the photons begin traveling large distances, they've been traveling that whole time until some of them enter our antennas and our satellites today. So remember in these coordinates, we sit still at some fixed value of co-moving um, location, R equals seven or whatever you'd like, you could call it R equals zero. And then light travels on these lovely, convenient 45 degree diagonals. So from this corner in the sky, it's like looking, putting your telescope over there. From this corner of the sky, it, looking in the opposite direction, we receive this uniform bath of photons that have been traveling towards us this whole time. Well, here's where Dickey and people start uh, raising some questions. We receive this remarkably uniform signal on the sky today from opposite sides of the sky, from, from, from any direction that we point to our, our radio telescopes, both on Earth and now uh, from satellites. There's a, a co-moving distance delta R across which we find uh, we receive these photons and they look remarkably uniform. However, 
Those photons were emitted at a finite age when the universe was only a short portion of its current age. It was only 380,000 years old as opposed to nearly 14 billion years old. Light can only but travel at a fixed speed, at least according to Einstein's theory. So if the universe has only been around for so long, then light could only have traveled so far. That's called the horizon distance. What's the furthest possible distance that a light beam could have traveled, traveling at that constant speed of light for as long as it was able to? So even though an actual physical light beam couldn't have traveled because the universe was optically opaque, any information, any physical signal, any force, anything that could is limited by Einstein's speed limit should only be able to travel up to and limited by the speed of light. That means there's a furthest distance according to which any information or influence or physical force or anything could have traveled since the Big Bang up to the time when that radiation was first emitted. That's called the horizon distance. And as they show, for any finite age, for any universe that has this beginning a finite time ago, at any moment in time, there's a furthest distance that anything traveling at the speed of light could possibly have gotten to yet. That's called the horizon distance. So what they show is that at the time that the microwave background photons began their, their journey, when they first began to free stream, the universe was still so young that the furthest possible distance that any causal influence should have been able to travel was a tiny fraction of the distance across which we actually measure remarkably uniform signals on the sky today. So the horizon distance was actually like a factor of 100 shorter than the smoothness scale across which we receive remarkably uniform information. How could that be? If this portion of the sky never had a chance to become in, in any kind of physical equilibrium or even to exchange a single tweet, to have absolutely no information of this part of the sky about what the average conditions are in this part of the sky, how could they have become uh, indistinguishable in the signals we receive today? That became known as a horizon problem. And this was heightened when, uh, as, as more and more data came in, more and more uh, careful observations in the microwave background radiation, it became clear that that signal really is uniform to one part in 100,000. It's remarkably uniform to, to a tiny fraction of a percent, or is that to one thousandth of one percent, that signal is uniform across every direction we look in the sky today, even though it's coming from all these regions that when that light was emitted, couldn't have possibly had any physical interaction with each other or had even a single you know, kind of status update saying, I'm gonna release my photons at this temperature, you should do the same. So at the time that the light was emitted, the, the kind of um, smoothness scale was much, much larger than the kind of causally um, self-connected scale. And that becomes known as the horizon problem. So why on earth would the CMB be so uniform today to this exponential accuracy from regions of the sky that were never ever in causal contact? Plus, why on earth do we have this distribution of scales that I started off in the beginning? Where does large scale structure come from? Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Sorry, this is my other, my, my anthropomorphic um, uh, analogy for why the horizon problem should make you, should give you pause. This usually works better when we're meeting in person in an actual classroom. But imagine, you know, we're all sitting in a nice big comfortable room, uh, socially distanced, and everyone has come in the room and I've, uh, I've, I've stolen your cell phones, sorry, you'll get it back. I've temporarily taken your cell phones uh, and your laptops. I've blindfolded you all and, and um, put in earplugs and handed every single one of you a ping pong ball. I won't actually do this, but you know, just imagine. And then without any prior coordination, I say, please throw your ping pong ball at the same speed at the same time to one part in 10 to the five, without any chance to coordinate, without anyone saying, ready, set, go. Or you'd be able to say to your neighbor, here's my plan, let's coordinate, right? That's what it's like to have these causally disjoint regions emitting these photons, not just with kind of the same energy, but with the exact same energy released at the exact same time. That's the point of this series of, of kind of ping pong balls distributed through space. Now, as I was saying, what about the lumps? This entire Big Bang model has still had to assume kind of by fiat with no real explanation that there was some initial lumpiness there's some inhomogeneity that over time could then grow to become this cascading hierarchy of scales, which is why we'd have super clusters of galaxies separated by huge voids and all the rest. So this, the Big Bang model had some amazing successes, but some pretty stubborn quandaries as well. So I'll pause there again and ask for questions about that. Any questions on, on the kind of shortcomings of the Big Bang as people began articulating them throughout the 60s and 70s? 
feel free to jump in or use a chat or either way. And again, there's more, uh, uh, there's more on the kind of quantitative details of that in, the, uh, in that optional primer you can find on, on the Canvas site. Um, so Fisher asks, is it useful to think of, of the universe as spherical still? Yeah, these pictures get pretty hard. So basically we can imagine at every, we can imagine drawing, um, choosing some point of interest and drawing some sphere around it and asking what's happening um, in that region. Is that, re that region itself will grow over time? And is that region representative of some larger sample from which it's taken? So we can still draw, ask about the behavior of some randomly drawn sphere, even if the global shape of space not, might not be spherical. Because you can imagine filling a perfectly rectilinear Euclidean space with a bunch of, of uh, representative spheres whose, whose behavior we could, we could study. Now, it could be that the entire universe has some global shape to it. We could be living in a, in a closed universe where on the larger scales, it actually looks like a sphere. But we could again do the same trick. We could still ask about locally, let's fill it with some representative shape and ask about the average behavior within that shape. So what, what we mean by what's spherical, uh, we, we, can we can continue to use spheres usefully, even if we live in a flat universe, as long as we're careful to, to distinguish a kind of sample volume versus the kind of global property. Good question. Alex asks, what about the model problem? Yes, very good. So I left that one out. That was a that exercised Alan Guth in particular, because, uh, and maybe that's getting ahead. Maybe I'll talk a bit about that actually in the next, next uh, last part of the class. That's a good question, Alex. Any other questions about that, about the, the shortcomings of Big Bang? Okay, let me press on, because these are extra questions. Alex is already uh, giving us a kind of segue to the next part, which is great. So let's go to that last part for class today. I love this photograph. This is to me priceless. This is what Alan Guth looked like circa 1980. I think MIT used to have a law that you had to dress so as to match your own blackboard. I think we relaxed that rule. Anyway, he was blending into his surroundings. His room, like the universe, should have been uh, perfectly homogenous and isotropic. Anyway, here's a very young, smiling Alan, uh, approximately 40 years ago. He was wondering about these questions as well, as we'll see in a moment. He was, however, coming at this having been trained at MIT in particle theory. He was not trained in relativity or cosmology. He was much more the same generation as Tony Z, whose work we talked about briefly in the previous lecture. When Alan was in graduate school, uh, he was studying high energy physics and therefore, therefore not um, gravitation or cosmology. He wound up doing a series of postdoctoral studies. He kind of, like Tony Z, accidentally heard some talks uh, about uh, some of his early work in, in um, gravitation, and particularly heard some lectures by Robert Dickey, when Dickey was on the kind of lecture circuit talking about these curiosities or shortcomings of the Big Bang model. And that really stuck in Alan's mind. He was not originally asking questions about the cosmos, but he was kind of haphazardly encountering some of those questions, again, very much like, like uh, Tony Z around the same time. What Alan was interested in was in things like spontaneous symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism. That was kind of all the rage for a lot of particle theorists uh, in the early and mid seventies by then. And he was wondering about shapes for the potential energy function of that Higgs field that might have a kind of uh, extra structure. There might be a kind of dimple uh, to that energy function. We can imagine the Higgs field getting temporarily stuck at some metastable state at the origin of its own potential energy function, where there's a barrier in any direction, but it's not a, an infinitely high barrier. So according to quantum theory, that Higgs field should eventually decay to the genuine global state of lowest energy anywhere along this so-called vacuum circle. And Alan was realizing upon hearing Bob Dickey's lecture that that could have remarkable cosmological implications. If there were a time, even a short time, during which the matter that's filling the universe could be temporarily stuck in a metastable state in which it had some non-zero potential energy, but it couldn't release or relax that energy arbitrarily quickly because it's stuck in this metastable so-called false vacuum, then that could have implications for the global shape of space and not just for the behavior of elementary particles. I, I highlight the, the date. Thank goodness for historians that Alan is unbelievably anal retentive and writes everything down and has pretty neat handwriting. A lot of people who write things down and have egregious handwriting, and there's more people who don't write things down. Alan, though he likes to blend in with his blackboard, writes things down with neat handwriting. And so I note the date, 41 years ago to the day, today's December 7th, to the day, he was up very late as is his watch. 
piecing together his ideas about these Higgs-like functions with these funny metastable states where the energy density of the universe could get trapped temporarily at some large non-zero value. And he was putting that together in his mind with the lectures he had literally just heard from Robert Dickey not long before. And he calls this a spectacular realization. So my request number three uh, to you scientists is both write things down, use neat handwriting, and when you do something cool, tell us it. Tell us that you're excited and put it in a box. Because when we're going through your notebooks, honestly, most of it's just garbage. We just don't care. But he actually does a favor and put it in a box. Pay attention to this. His notebook's actually now on display in the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. This Literally this page of notes. He realized that this kind of feature could actually lead to a cosmologically distinct kind of evolution. That if you have a period of time, even briefly, during which the energy density, the, the, the amount of stuff per volume gets stuck, gets stuck at some non-zero value and can't change quickly, then the energy density could remain constant. If the energy density, the stuff per volume remains constant, then very counterintuitively, you have a runaway growth in the size of space. That stretching function, the scale factor, going back just to Einstein's equations, will grow exponentially quickly. It'll have a period of accelerated expansion during which the universe won't just get bigger, it'll get bigger faster. If you have this kind of counterintuitive, even temporary phase during which the stuff per volume stays constant, even as the volume grows exponentially. That could happen, Allen began wondering, if you have this kind of weird state of matter that was at least hypothetical and of right interest to particle physicists because they were worried about things like symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism. That does not happen with, you know, kind of marbles in a bucket. It does not happen with electrons or quarks or protons. It happens for certain kinds of elementary particles, including things like these very simple fields like the Higgs field, the Higgs particle, which for other reasons could have some funny shape to their potential energy function. Uh, Alex, I'm going to skip the monopole problem, but it comes from this discussion as well, and I'd be delighted to chat more about that if you'd like afterwards. But in the interest of time, uh, this was, Alan was worried about some exotic features from these Higgs fields that can get kind of twisted up in some topological shape. But he was really just wondering what happens if the universe gets stuck even temporarily, such that the matter that dominates, that fills it, can't release or relax its potential energy arbitrarily quickly. That's called a metastable state. And if you go back to Einstein's equations, exactly in the form that he began learning from Bob Dickey from that series of lectures, then you have these very different solutions for the average um, size of space. It grows exponentially quickly. And as Alan and others were quick to, to confirm, this happens kind of very naturally, or at least it's a kind of feature that one stumbles upon readily if one's studying these sort of exotic Higgs-like fields from particle physics, it does not happen with spin one half particles, for example. It does not very easily happen even with photons or gluons or things like that. It happens with these Higgs-like scalar particles most naturally. Soon after that, actually within a few months, a number of other colleagues, some in the United States, some in, in what was still then the Soviet Union, were finding similar behaviors, but even in even more generic or simple arrangements. So uh, Paul Steinhardt was working with his then PhD student, Andy Albrecht. They were at the time at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Alexander Serebinsky and Andre Linde were working quite independently of uh, Steinhardt and Albrecht. And then again, realizing that if you study the dynamics, the behavior of these exotic quantum fields, like a Higgs field, in a stretching space time, if you take that stretching of space seriously, then you don't even need to cook up those exotic Higgs-like potentials that Alan was first thinking about. Quite generically, you'll have a kind of damped oscillator behavior. But if you look at the evolution of some field like the Higgs field, its self-consistent change over time, its equation of motion includes a kind of damping factor like a damped oscillator. This comes from the fact that space itself is stretching and that alone is, turns out is enough to find these self-consistent solutions in which the field moves very slowly. You can, you can imagine rolling down this hill rolling down, sorry, rolling down slowly as a function of time because it's, uh, it's like a frictional overdamped oscillator. Again, there's more of that in the primer if you're curious to see more. Even that not literally fixed uh, behavior, it's literally, it's changing, it's changing slowly enough. That will lead to a slowly enough changing potential energy trapped in that field that you'll still get these nearly exponential like solutions. So you can have inflation happening even more generically as these folks began to find very soon after Allen, even without worrying about a very particular shape for the potential energy function. Just when you think about 
these fields like a Higgs-like field uh, in the early universe. So then you come back to those quandaries that Alan had first heard about from Bob Dickey. And you ask, how would these, uh, these things look if you now take into account this very early, very brief phase of fast stretching, of exponentially fast stretching of space? Go back to the equation that Dickey had first written down for the flatness problem. But now we have a phase during which the scale factor grows exponentially, e to the something times t. So it grows very fast in time while the energy density remains nearly constant. So instead of that falling with volume, it temporarily remains nearly constant. Now you'd see this uh, expression, the deviation of the universe from spatially flat, that deviation should rapidly fall to zero. The universe today should look indistinguishable from a flat universe because the difference from flatness was driven to zero dynamically by having even a very brief phase of exponentially rapid accelerating expansion, you drive the universe towards a flat shape rather than having it flow away from a flat shape. And again, I go through that in more quantitative detail in the primer. So the latest measurement from the Planck collaboration using a, an above, uh, using a satellite is that this parameter in our actual universe today is one to better than percent level accuracy. Now let me just pause. I know I'm gonna run long today, but I just can't help myself. When I was in graduate school, not super long ago, kind of long ago, I was friends with a bunch of uh, observational astronomy grad students in the dorm, and they were basically me. They, they would tease me, like, you're working on inflation, but we know that omega is 0.3, so you're a loser. Like, why do you waste your time on this? Some were nice, but a lot of them were actually kind of me. I was like, oh, no, you know, like, go look for more stuff. You're missing two-thirds of the stuff out there. Just try again. So maybe I was mean, too. But they were meaner. They were more of them. So when I was in grad school, it looked very much like omega was 0.3. And if you squinted at it, you could make it, maybe make it 0.35. It was not one, according to the best observations around the world. Today, it's one to better than percent level accuracy and they can just stick it. So I like sending them holiday cards saying, thinking of you, Omega's one, see you next year. Anyway, this is a remarkable shift even over the course of 20 to 25 years, let alone since the days of Lemaitre and Hubble. Okay. What about that more subtle one that Bob Dickey and James Peebles worked out called the so-called horizon problem? Let's go back to our funny map, our conformal map. You remember the, 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 how the horizon problem was originally phrased because we thought there was an origin to all of time, this big bang surface at tau equals zero. And if you add up the time between tau equals zero and when those photons begin to travel uh, freely, there was only a fixed horizon distance. It was much smaller than the smoothness scale that we could measure empirically. Well, if inflation happened, there should have been a very brief period before what had previously been called the Big Bang. So we're adding more real estate along our time axis. We're unfurling a little bit extra time that hadn't been taken into account in the standard Big Bang model. So if you, if you allow for more time before what you would call the Big Bang, you can continue tracing those past light cones further and further back. You see there should be some time earlier than what we were starting from, during which all the past light cones from the entire region we see today would indeed have overlapped. So then it would at least be plausible. There's at least now a, a causally self-consistent mechanism by means of which the universe could have similar conditions everywhere because they actually were causally connected at a time before we had previously taken into account. So therefore you could have the horizon distance, the maximum causal distance becomes actually much larger than the smoothness scale that we measure. So now the horizon distance is larger because we, there was more time that we hadn't yet taken into account. Any kind of causal influence would have had more time to propagate than we had previously accounted for. So now you get the ratio, at least in the right order. You can have a horizon distance that is larger. In fact, it could be much, much larger, exponentially larger than the smoothness scale we, we observe. Now remember, this is a funny coordinate. It takes an unbelievably short amount of physical or cosmic time, the time that we measure on our wristwatches, to accomplish that. In fact, it takes about 10 to the minus 36th of a single second. That's all it takes for this inflation. If the, infl if the universe expanded exponentially just for that sub, sub, sub blink of an eye, then all of a sudden the causal structure of the entire observable universe is turned upside down. But you, you basically erase the horizon problem because there actually was a time when all the stuff we see would have been in causal contact, very comfortably in causal contact. And the universe in that tiny blink, a billion, 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 billionth of a second grew by about 30 orders of magnitude. 
It didn't keep doing that. It's not doing, wasn't doing that uh, during the rest of this Big Bang evolution. There's this tiny blip and taking that into account suddenly rearranges the causal ordering and basically uh, addresses these, these, uh, these out of order causal conundrums. So here's a plot uh, in more familiar um, uh, coordinates, going back now to time measured in seconds and space measured in meters rather than um, uh, co-moving distance and conformal time. You can see that as you trace backwards from today, instead of going back to saying the universe at early times should have been on the order of one meter, you say at those early times the universe was actually exponentially tinier than you had thought. It grew exponentially quickly to map onto where we see today. And so the universe was so tiny, it could very easily have been in a kind of uh, equilibrium or at least a causally self-connected state. So during this tiny blink of an eye, the universe grew exponentially quickly and then mapped onto the standard Big Bang evolution. And that alone is enough to, to address the flatness and horizon problems. It turns out it does more than that as well. This is what gets, I think, even more exciting and what has occupied much of the community ever since that field, that Higgs-like field that was driving inflation that was very slowly evolving in its potential should have been subject to the uncertainty principle just like all matter should be. And this became clear to people about a year or so after Alan and Paul and Andy and all those folks began writing the first papers on inflation. By 1982, 83, pretty early on, people realized that not only would you have a kind of gross feature of the evolution of those exotic particle physics-like fields, they should also have quantum wiggles, because how could they not? Because they should be subject to the uncertainty principle. These are quantum fields evolving in a dynamical space-time. It's still, I still can't believe it, but it is the case that you can study the evolution of those quantum fluctuations with a remarkably simple looking oscillator equation. I've hidden all the hard stuff in this term. I made it look easy. But you can actually take into account that, that frictional damping, the stretching of space, and the, and the reaction of that kind of uh, a jittering trampoline back on the evolution of matter, we can solve these equations to unbelievable accuracy and realize that we should have a prediction today for tiny seeds, tiny unevenness in the, in the very early distribution of matter and energy because the universe was filled with quantum fields. And as we've seen a number of times now, quantum jitter, the uncertainty principle means that we could never specify the energy of that field to arbitrary precision at any time. At any given moment, that field would be subject to slight, slight quantum fluctuations in the distribution of energy across space. That starts to yield this tiny little fluctuation in why there's slightly more matter and energy in this region of space than the other one. So that those now, those very tiny quantum scale fluctuations get stretched as the whole universe stretches. As the, as the scale factor grows exponentially, you have the average length between this sort of um, you know, distance between crests of those tiny wiggles get stretched to galactic and even supergalactic scales all within that blink of an eye. So now you have a reason why there's an in, in primordial inhomogeneity, and you also have a reason why it's on the right length scales. It's going to seed galaxy formation, not kind of mess around with your, with your atoms like a lamb shift, because you have matter uh, in an early quantum state as the universe is stretching exponentially. So you can go back to now a much more modern picture of the very tiny lumpiness captured in that microwave background radiation this is from the Planck satellite team, is exaggerating with false color imaging, the slight one part in 100,000 offsets between the regions of the sky that are slightly uh, higher energy photons in the CMB and slightly lower energy photons. And the idea now is that the regions of the sky from which these photons were emitted are telling us about the very, very tiny unevenness in the distribution of matter and energy at the moment those photons were emitted. There was a tiny, tiny little gra excess gravitational potential. There was a little more stuff per volume at that region. So the photon then had to spend a little more energy climbing out of that gravitational well. We should receive it today as being a little less energy than average, very slightly less. Meanwhile, other photons would have come from regions that were slightly evacuated, a little less dense than average. So the photons we receive today had to spend less energy gravitationally to overcome that very tiny gravitational potential. They should have slightly more energy on average today than, than the average. So we can actually map the quantum fluctuations, which kind of leave an imprint in this dynamical uh, fabric of space and time that then maps to this distribution of these very tiny unevenness in the CMB. Okay. 
Then I've been mapped by three generations of satellites above the ground with increasingly precise uh, ground-based measurements as well. And each of these came out sort of with 10 years apart with an increase of about a factor of 30 in the resolution, the angular resolution of the sky. I was a senior in college a long time ago when the first of these released their data in uh, September, 1992. I was a senior that year. And the COBE team led actually in part by our own Ray Weiss, who later became very famous for his work on gravitational waves. Ray was one of the science leaders for this early mission, a NASA mission. They were the first ones to measure these tiny, tiny fluctuations on the order of about one part in 100,000, but over huge scales. It was like they had very poor eyeglasses. They, it was very fuzzy, very poor resolution. Roughly 10 years later, another NASA mission called WMAP was able to uh, increase the resolution by a factor of 30, and they released their data in 2003. Then the Planck, a European Space Agency collaboration called the Planck Satellite, released their data 10 years after that, so in, starting in 2013, with another in, uh, factor of 30 in the spatial resolution. And so we can now make plots like this. The solid green line is the generic prediction from the simplest models of inflation. What's the pattern of bumps and wiggles on the sky you should see today is basically kind of fancy Fourier transform, more or less. What's the power on different angular scales that you should see today? And you can actually measure many, many quantities of uh, many features of that distribution. Uh, the red dots are the actual observations from the Planck team. And in many cases, the error bars are expanded so we can see them with our naked eye. This is such a, a precise set of measurements that in fact, um, sometimes we have to make, make the error bars larger. So now not only do, you know, do we live in a universe that is indistinguishable from flat as inflation suggests we should, but the actual pattern of those wiggles, the pattern of the une very slight early unevenness in the sky matches predictions to, again, better than percent level accuracy. I find that astonishing. Let me take a few more minutes. There's one more set of things that were found, or I should say were predicted. So inflation should not only make these early primordial density perturbations where the photon should be slightly more or less energetic, depending on the quantum fluctuations of that Higgs-like field, there should be primordial gravitational waves as well. This is now much like the waves that Ray and his huge team found uh, locally from the collision of say black holes. There should be primordial gravitational waves excited by inflation as well. And these are waves that actually stretch and squeeze space in a kind of two dimensional pattern. So these are mathematically more complicated structure. You should have this kind of periodic squeezing, stretching, and then inverted by 90 degrees. So the, a version of these were found by the LIGO collaboration uh, and announced early in 2016. These are not primordial. These are from local effects like the collision of black holes uh, in our own galaxy. Inflation says similar kinds of things should have been happening uh, in the earliest moments everywhere in space through this very violent, rapid stretching of space. So go back to that kind of dance party I was telling you about before. At the moment when uh, the electrically neutral atoms start to form, if there were this sea of, uh, or bath of gravitational waves, then the kind of high school auditorium, imagine where this dance is happening, should have been subjected to this periodic, very, very particular pattern of squeezing and stretching. So while the atoms are forming, they would have been going, uh, gravity waves would have been rippling through them. That should yield a characteristic twisting or curl pattern, a polarization in that cosmic microwave background radiation. Not only should there be slightly hotter and colder spots in the sky, if you zoom in by a factor of, uh, of, of uh, another 20, you should actually see a kind of corkscrew pattern that the hotter and colder regions actually have this kind of twisting pattern, which really is like that container of space time being stretched and squeezed as the gravity waves kind of uh, ran through it. In March of 2014, a team using uh, the BICEP satellite at the South Pole announced they had actually measured exactly that corkscrew pattern. This is from their, their fa now famous or infamous paper. We had a celebration here at MIT. This is me <laughs> cheering on Andre Linde and members of the team, the experimental team. We had a toast with non-alcoholic cider and be clear it was middle of the afternoon. We were getting drunk on the ideas, but not on hard cider. Unfortunately, pretty soon after that, it turned out the BICEP team had measured data consistent with local noise. My friends, many of my friends on the BICEP team managed to find out that the Milky Way galaxy is dusty which we knew. <laughs> so they basically were, they were, the signal they had hoped to measure 
was actually swamped by foregrounds they had not yet been able to control. And this was found by a number of very sophisticated analyses soon afterwards. So it remains an open question to this day whether these primordial curling twisting patterns uh, really can be detected. Maybe they're such small magnitude it'll, be, it'll evade our detection, we don't know. There are ongoing efforts to this day. BICEP is now souped up and they have a much more sophisticated series of telescopes. There's another team also at the South Pole, the Planck satellite, there's new efforts being built on the Atacama Desert, very high altitude in Chile. So stay tuned, we'll hopefully learn more about that final prediction from inflation before too long. Let me wrap up. Cosmic inflation arises from types of matter in interactions that we now don't know exist, that are kind of heart and soul of this particle cosmology community, things like the Higgs boson. And it addresses several of these long-standing conundra about the standard Big Bang model. It makes specific predictions what we should see in the sky today, including very minute statistical predictions for things like the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the simplest models fit to unbelievable accuracy, despite what my mean dorm mates used to say in the mid 90s. Now we have extraordinary agreement with many, many of these predictions, albeit not the final. So why is the universe lumpy? Why is this, this cascade of scales? Because space time is wiggly and matter is jiggly. Now there's an alternate hypothesis, my final uh, set of slides. I mentioned this last time and I just wanna make it clear. I mentioned that Alan Good's been working on this since around 1980, since December 7th, 1979, in fact. As you also know, he's won many awards, including the award from the Boston Globe for the messiest office in Boston. This was published in the Globe at the time that he won first place. They also published these photographs. These are all shots from his office at the time. I used to have to walk through that just to try to meet with my PhD advisor. It was like not OSHA certified. So an alternate hypothesis for why the universe is so messy is actually because Alan's been generating the mess in his own office and it's expanded to cosmic scales. So I'm gonna close with that and I'll be glad to, uh, to stay a bit longer. If people have questions, again, I'm sorry for running late. Feel free to drop off if you need. Any questions on that? The photos of Alan's office are on Canvas. If you wanna study that part of today's lecture is probably the most important lesson you'll ever take away. You can study those at, at your leisure as well.